the development and maturation of the various symplectic and hybrid symplectic schemes that we've been discussing allowed researchers to make enormous progress in the long-term integration of dynamical systems, and in particular, the long-term integration of the solar system. However, at the same time that all of this development was taking place, there always existed a different option. Rather than going the symplectic route, what if you could just limit your truncation error to be below machine precision of whatever data type that you were using? If you were able to do this, then you would effectively be conserving every conserved quantity of any dynamical system to within the only metric that really matters, the precision of the encoding of your data type. However, to do this, you would need a very high order integrator, which would be incredibly costly from a computational standpoint. In the 80s and early 90s, computers had not yet reached a level where you could practically integrate these incredibly high order schemes out to the hundreds of millions and billions of years that researchers wanted in order to study the long-term stability of the solar system. But computers consistently get faster. Their clock speeds increase, the amount of memory available increases, and eventually we reached a point where these types of integrations became feasible. Today, there's a case to be made and has been made by multiple different research groups that it is actually better to embark on long-term numerical integrations of n-body systems using adaptive time step high order integrators rather than going the symplectic route. Another key benefit of this approach is that these integrators can support non-conservative forces much more easily than the symplectic schemes, which are intended to integrate Hamiltonian energy conserving systems. And so these high order methods can actually allow you to easily encode dissipative forces like drag and other effects. So here we will discuss a few different options for going this route and then discuss in detail one particular implementation that is very popular today. One option suggested very early on are high order Runge-Kutta and Runge-Kutta-Nystrom schemes. RKN integrators are a variation on the Runge-Kutta approach and they explicitly solve second order differential systems of the form x double dot is equal to some function of x and t. These are very well adapted to conservative systems such as the n-body gravitational system. Examples of this are found in the literature in Dorman et al. in a series of papers in 1977 and 1987, Blaines and Moan in a paper from 2002, and a wide variety of others. And you can construct the very high order Runge-Kuttas and Runge-Kutta Nystroms with this paper in particular describing a 10th, 12th order scheme. Alternatively, we can use what is known as gauss radau quadrature. And here we will follow the developments in a paper by Rain and Spiegel, published in 2015, who based their approach on prior work by Everhart in a work from 1985. We begin with the system. X double dot is a function of X, X dot, and T, where the dots as usual represent derivatives in time. We are no longer requiring our system to be conservative. We are allowing for the forces to be functions of the time derivatives of the positions. And therefore we are allowing for any general description of force. We are going to expand in a truncated series in time. That is X double dot evaluated at a time T is approximated by its initial condition, X double dot naught plus a truncated summation from i equals one to seven of some vectors a sub i times t to the ith power. This term is equivalent to our function evaluated at time equal to zero. We will now define h as time scaled by our time step delta t. And we will define vectors b sub i as these a sub i vectors times delta t to the ith power. These a sub i's from this summation. With these definitions and this expansion, we can then write x double dot at h is approximated by the initial x double dot naught plus the summation from i equals one to seven of these b sub i vectors times h to the i. And I'll pause here and note that the order of the summation, this seven, comes from the precision that we are trying to match. Our standard double precision data type has an encoding error of something like 10 to the negative 16th 
for values of order one. If we were trying to match a more precise data type, we could take this to any arbitrarily higher order. If we were trying to match a less precise data type, then we could take the summation to fewer terms. So this is kind of an open parameter. We are following the specific development that it was presented in the Rain and Spiegel paper, which was trying to match the standard double precision encoding used in most computer languages. The other important thing to note here is that H is dimensionless. It is a time unit divided by a time unit. The B sub I values are accelerations. We rewrite this expression and get x double dot of h is approximated by x double dot naught plus the summation from i equals 1 to 8 of a set of vectors u sub i times the product from j equals 0 to i minus 1 of the difference between h and the substeps hj. These substeps, the set hj, from j equals 0 to 7 are coefficients that are in the range 0 and 1, and h naught is defined as strictly 0. These g sub i's depend only on the evaluations of our dynamics f at the substeps h sub n for n less than or equal to i. So for example, if we have h equal to h1, then the g1 vector must be x double dot 1 minus x double dot naught divided by h1. If we have h equal to h2, then the g2 vector will be x double dot 2 minus x double dot naught minus g1 h2, this value here, divided by the product of h2 with h2 minus h1, and so on and so forth. And in here, we have use the shorthand x sub i double dot is equivalent to x double dot evaluated at the substep h sub i. We can now integrate this expression twice in order to get values for x dot and x. x dot of h is the integral of x double dot of h in time and is approximated by x naught dot so the initial condition first derivative plus h times the time step delta t all times x double dot naught plus h over two times b1 plus 2h over three times b2 and so on and so forth to all of the terms in the series that we got from the previous statement of the summation. And similarly, if we integrate this again, we get x of h is the integral of this expression and will look like the initial condition x naught plus the initial derivative x dot naught times h times delta t plus a similar set of multiplications with the leading terms being h squared delta t squared over 2 times x naught double dot plus h over 3 times the quantity b1 plus h over 2 times quantity b2 plus all of the remaining terms. So this gives us the general form of what we want to implement, but doesn't necessarily tell us how we go about picking the substeps and the various dialed in quantities in order to make all of this accurate. In order to make these approximations accurate, we use what is known as Gauss-Radau spacing for the substeps. The basic idea is that we want to match the integral from time t0 to t1 of some function f of x t to the summation over n points of some weights wj times the evaluation of the function at nodes tj. So the w's are weights and the t's are called nodes. And then whatever is left over is the error as usual. We can generalize this procedure even further and write this integral as the summation over weights times the function evaluated at specific nodes t sub j plus a second summation from k equals 1 to m of a different set of weights, v sub k, times the function evaluated at a different set of nodes, t prime of k, plus the remaining error. The idea here is that in this first summation, we set the weights and leave the nodes as unknowns. And in the second one, we set the nodes and leave the weights as unknown. And balancing between these two, we are able to minimize the resulting error.
in the case where m is equal to zero, this is known as Gauss's rule or Gaussian spacing. The optimal quadrature for a integrator of degree 2n minus 1 is Gaussian. If, on the other hand, we have m equal to 1, that is this summation having only one term, and t1 prime being set to t0 or t1, that is either of the endpoints of this integration, then this is known as a gauss radowski The unknown nodes, t, j, can be calculated as the roots of the ratio of Legendre polynomial p n minus 1 of t plus the Legendre polynomial p sub n of t divided by 1 plus t. This gives rise to a polynomial expression. Solving for its roots gives you the optimal placement of these nodes. So in their 2015 paper, Rain and Spiegel, following earlier work by Everhart, constructed a 15th order scheme using eight total function evaluations. The scheme is implicit because you need to know the forces during the next time step to evaluate all of the coefficients. And to address this, they use a predictor corrector, similar to what is being done in MATLAB's ODE113 for its sequence acceleration. The basic principle involved is that you guess at an initial b sub i value, and then you iterate until convergence. This is implemented as the integrator IAS15 in the software package Rebound. And this has become a de facto standard among much of the celestial mechanics community, the way that Mercury was for the previous generation of that community. I urge all of you to read this paper carefully. It presents a lot of very good development of explicitly how the integrator is built, as well as a lot of reasoning behind it, and arguments for why, in certain cases, this should be preferred over going the symplectic route. Here, I am reproducing a single result from this paper, which shows the performance of various integrators on the problem of the long-term integration of the outer solar system that is, the gas and ice giants of the solar system, out to hundreds of millions of Jovian orbital periods. This is plotting the relative energy error. So you can think of this as the accumulation of error in the total energy of the unbody system. And the various integrators that are being considered are IAS-15, the 15th order gauss radau scheme, as well as a variety of integrators built into the Mercury software package, which was Chambers' original hybrid symplectic package. And this features the Bower Stower, a Radau scheme that is in Mercury, and the mixed variable symplectic integrator that is in Mercury. You can see that all of these accumulate error as they go along, but IAS 15 significantly outperforms the others, starting with a relative energy error of 10 to the negative 16 in its initial few time steps, which is right down there at the numerical encoding precision of the data type that is being used. You will also see here in the legend a reference to something known as Brouwer's Law. This is a fundamental result for the symplectic integration of n-body systems, which essentially says that when you are using a symplectic integrator with a fixed time step, your error accumulation will be solely due to floating point errors and thus must resemble a random walk in time. And so the error must grow for an ideal symplectic integrator as the square root of t. However, you will note that many of these schemes, including MVS, which should be fully symplectic for fixed time steps, do not necessarily behave in this fashion. A few of them do, although their slopes are not exactly there, but the only one that exactly matches Brewer's law is IAS-15. Since this paper came out, there have been a lot more developments in this field. There now exist multiple different fully open sourced implementations of a variety of gauss radau schemes building on top of this original work and implementing alternative schemes that also give you similar performance or even better performance. And because computers are still consistently getting faster and more capable, this is now a completely viable option for integration, not only of these incredibly long-term systems, but for short-term integrations where you wish to achieve incredibly high precision but for example, include non-conservative forces or include a variety of different masses interacting together, as is the case whenever we are thinking about spacecraft interacting with the major bodies of our solar system. This concludes our discussion of numerical integration.
obviously there's vastly more to say. There are almost an uncountable number of different methods, different specialized approaches, different implementations that can be found both in the literature and increasingly in open source software implementations. It is entirely possible to go out there and grab incredibly highly performing integrators, but as always, you have to be careful to understand what it is that they are doing. You should never ever grab a piece of code and just assume that it's going to do exactly what you need it to do. Every single one of these implementations carries approximations, carries assumptions, and carries basic concepts with it that must be understood in order to ensure that the computer does not lead you astray. However, we have now provided ourselves with the basic building blocks of the vast majority of these, and so hopefully that will allow you to make these assessments as you come into contact with these various tools in your professional careers.